Hey, 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 what's going on, everyone? You are now listening to Resilience in Action with Aaron Brown. Perfect, perfect. Hello, everyone. This is Resilience in Action with Aaron Brown, and I am sitting here with Mike Kahlo. Mike is a is a health coach. He's a Muay Thai. You you fought Muay Thai, correct? Yes, man. You got it. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, strength and wellness coach. And I'm not even gonna, I'm not even going to butcher it. So, Mike, go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, I appreciate that. First off, I got to give you props for just acing that pronunciation, by the way. I really appreciate that. Um, and yeah, I've got, you know, a variety of backgrounds in the health and wellness space. I have a big passion for it. So I like I could honestly, I don't want to bore you with all the credentials, not to toot my own horn, but just because I think it's kind of no one's ever asked me, ironically, for any of the coaches out there. I have over 15 certifications. I've never had one client ask me about all my certifications or like, how many do you have? Like, you know, like I just do it for the passion of it and the continuing education. But like, if you're thinking like, oh, I need to have like 10 certifications and this, that, you don't need that. You, you Like in my opinion, but so I started as a certified trainer when I was 18, um, just as a fun side note, like I actually was always obese as a kid. Like I grew up pretty heavy. And I, but I always played sports and whatnot. And when I was um, 15 turning 16, I got cut from our varsity baseball team the year after we had won a state title. I was like, oh, we want a state title. I'm a shoe in like, no problem. But my coach is like, Hey man, you're too big. You're too slow. I got to cut you. Like, it's just what's best for the team. And from that point on, I got a strength coach, shout out to John Furia and acceleration sports training in Long Island, New York. They're they work with like Yankee players, Mets players, Jets, Giants, like the biggest, best in the area. And they absolutely changed my life. And then I became a trainer. I started going to school for athletic training. And then I changed my path a bunch of times. I ended up going into a jujitsu school and um, worked with my first MMA coach. Shout out to coach Eric Uresk. I still work with him to this day and ended up becoming like a, a martial artist. I mean, I did martial arts as a kid, but combined my passion for martial arts, for fitness, for sports, nutrition, did educational stuff along the way. And I ended up actually going a professional fighter route. I actually started in MMA. I got injured, had to retire from that because I couldn't grapple the same way I needed to. And I ended up going through a tremendous amount of therapy and um, recovering to enough where I could do boxing and Muay Thai. And then was able to pursue some awesome things. I got lots of stories. I got to live in Thailand for six months. I got to live in Vegas for almost a year. Like so many cool things that have come from all that, but that's a little bit about me that I try not to rant too much and bounce all around. No, it's absolutely okay. Um, I know the listeners like want to hear like, okay, so you said you got injured. What happened? How'd you get injured? Ooh, this is important. To me, it's an important story or important experience. I always like to share, especially with my fighters. Um, And I know you had Deuce on. Shout out to Deuce Carter. Um, absolutely awesome fighter. Very inspiring uh, individual and like just really, really great person overall. And that's like one of the cool things. But going back to the injury, I was in my second ever amateur MMA fight. I, um, I was in Mount and I, I was kind of like, I'm, I'm a nice person, you know, like, I, I don't know if you guys can tell. I'm a pretty nice person. I don't <laughs> think I'm an intimidating, scary dude. And I don't really actually want to hurt people. Uh, which is ironic because I signed up to be a professional fighter where we go into a cage and hurt each other. Uh, but to me, that was like kind of okay. And they, we both agreed to it. So my point of saying all that is I had Mount, which means I'm on top of the person. And this was a New Jersey amateur fight and in New Jersey at the time, the amateur rules are when you go to the ground, you can't punch the other person in the face. You can strike and do whatever on the feet, But when it goes to the ground, you can only hit to the body from the neck down. So you can punch their shoulder. You can punch their waist. You can do hit their legs, but you can't punch the face. So I started punching their shoulder, trying to dislocate their shoulder. I was like, all right, this is going to be a great way to do something. And the thought process in MMA is, especially if you're in mount, it's a very dangerous position. So they're going to put their arms up to try and defend. I snagged an arm bar. And instead of going into one position which would be a little bit more advantageous to not getting hurt. I went to my back and instead of breaking their arm, I was waiting for them to tap. I thought they would tap where I should have done in hindsight, which sounds kind of mean. I should have just broke their arm. And since I didn't, they lifted me up and slammed me on my neck. 
Oh. And thankfully, like in the moment I was okay, but I ended up breaking a rib and herniating a disc in my lumbar spine. Ooh. And I continued the fight and I ended up winning that fight by decision. It was a crazy fight. It was a really <laughs> intense fight. And I ended up throwing up after that fight. I realized later I had a concussion. Um, at the moment, you don't realize what's going on. And yeah, so that started. And then that was a Saturday. Monday, I went back to practice. It was a wrestling practice. And I went for a throw. My rib completely was, it was, had a hairline fracture that completely fractured. I could see, you could see the like bone kind of out of alignment. And then I went to go get x-rays like, yeah, you definitely have a fracture. I was like, my back doesn't feel right either, but they put me in the MRI and they're like, yeah, we don't see anything. Um, so, you know, just rest your rib for a little bit. It's going to be painful, but then you'll be okay. After like two months, three months, my back still wasn't feeling right. I, again, back to my acceleration team, strength conditioning coach, I had a great team around me. Like something doesn't sound right, man. Like even when we're doing our physical tests, it seems like something's wrong. Seems like a herniation. And when I went back to go into an MRI, instead of being in a laying what's called prone position, meaning originally I was laying kind of down, this time they had me sitting up and leaning forward. And when they put me in that position, not only I had one herni herniation, but I had eight the one had compounded over like three months of training yeah. that I had four herniated discs in my lumbar spine and four herniated discs in my cervical spine. So like, listen, man, like you definitely cannot fight. Um, you should not do any of this. Like you can seriously risk paralysis, nerve damage, like all these things. And I was like, yeah, no, I'm still going to do it anyway. So I fought two more times. I wasn't able to go through a training camp. I think the way I should, and I ended up losing those two fights. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, all right, I just have to accept the reality. Like my dream's gone. Like, so I, I really, this was about 23. I was 23 years old when this was happening. So it was like, it was so soul crushing and, yeah. and hard. And then at, but there's a good side to this, right? There's the positive of about 25, 26. I actually met my wife. Um, who was not my wife at the time. And she, I just met her after I had my last fight. And she was really supportive of my passion for fighting. I ended up working for the UFC in New York at one of their gym locations and their corporate offices. So I was able to coach and, and work with great professionals and get my passion back for, you know, the coaching and the fighting side. And then over time, I started like progressively going through therapy, healing my back. I ended up getting it down. So right now I currently have two herniated discs in my lumbar spine and no herniations in my cervical. Um, so I just had a great team of, I did aqua therapy. I didn't do surgery. Now there's a, to get to add a caveat here without getting too technical when it comes to bulging and herniated discs, it's mm -hmm. basically the positioning of the vertebrae and the padding and cushing in between. And the best analogy I've ever heard was from the doctor, like, listen, so, cause a lot of people hear like herniated discs, like you can't fix that, mm -hmm. but depending on what happens, the fluid in the actual disc and in the vertebrae, if it's, they, they call it the jellies out of the donut. If the liquid and the fluid isn't pushing out, then you can actually repair it. But if it's beyond that point, then they have to go in for surgery, potentially fuse it, or it's beyond repair. Yeah. So I was at a point while it still was herniated, it wasn't in a position where it wasn't able to be fixed with physical therapy. I did aqua training, chiropractic. I, I to be transparent, I, I went through a six month period where I was like, I had addiction to, to painkillers. And I say that to create awareness because I'm always very hesitant to people to get on painkillers now since that experience i'm so glad you brought that up um because like going through like i went through i was looking through your social media and looking at life of a fighter and, and life of fitness and i want to i want you to talk about that um because i know i know somewhere somebody out there listening to this that's going to help them you know shout out to you for being super transparent about that like what, what pill was it? Um, how, like, I know, I know you have to take the pain meds, you know, to feel better. When did yeah. you know that it was becoming an issue? Yeah. And I, I, I'm really fortunate or unfortunate that I had awareness to it because like, I have addiction in my family. Like in my opinion, is my humble opinion, pretty much everyone in my family is an addict to one capacity or another. We just have that gene. It's just, maybe it's my addiction was always like food and fitness. So mm -hmm. it wasn't always like going to drugs or drinking or things like that. And I, it was prescribed. It was Vicodin. It was just prescribed. And the, from my perspective on it, and this is what I look at in the medical community and talking as, as a healthcare professional myself and like talking to physical therapists and doctors, 
usually muscle relaxers or painkillers or things like that are used to, when you start to go to physical therapy, it allows you to go through exercises, ranges of motion, and just be able to tolerate the pain enough so that you can progressively get better. That's gotcha. the slippery slope to that is you can start to abuse it. And I, that's exactly what I did. I have that addictive personality. I was like, Oh, one makes me feel good. I'll take like three. And then I started noticing about a month in, you know, once I was, I still go to physical therapy, I would do my thing and I would use it because it would allow me to train too. So I was still actively training. Yeah. And I started noticing even when I wasn't training on my days off, I would take it and I would take it multiple times a day. And I started to notice like if I wouldn't take it for a day, when I had to refill my prescription, I would have some of the withdrawal symptoms. And I was like, oh, this is a really real serious thing. And like, I had really good friends around me that were noticing like, Hey man, like I noticed you take those all the time now. Like what's going on? Are you okay? And it was after about six months, I realized I was like, I need to just stop altogether. Cause at that point, well, I still had the prescription. I was still going through physical therapy and all that. You know, my doctor was like, Hey, you don't really need this anymore. Um, and I could have, I could just acquire it by other means. And yeah. I've really held myself accountable to not doing that. And it was honestly, I was glad I caught it then because I could see how it becomes a very dangerous, slippery slope of then it can get expensive, especially if you're acquiring it, not through like legal means. And then you're, you're, it, it just, one thing can lead to another. So that was a little bit on my experience. What, how I started to notice it, I listened to the people around me. It was hard to accept at first. Cause you want to think like that won't happen to me. Yeah. That, that like, even just getting injured in my fight career, when I first started, I was like, I'll never get injured. I'll just, I'll be the exception that just makes it through without any injuries. And I obviously wasn't, I was like, Oh, I'll take pink curls and I'll be the exception that won't have an issue with it. I obviously did. And I was just fortunate going back to that original point of, I had people around me and I was aware enough and honest enough with myself. I was like, all right, I need to change. And I've, I've definitely to be again, transparent since then I've taken pills in different ways um, definitely when I was even living in Vegas, I had some party days where I would maybe do like some MDMA or things like that. But at that moment I realized like, all right, this is just not an avenue I can go down. So I just mm -hmm. don't do painkillers or muscle relaxers or things like that. It's just, you know, something I, I avoid for that very reason. Yeah. Um, I, I, I have a very similar story with, um, Percocets. I had, um, I tore my ACL. And I was at work. I was stopping a um, shoplifter and we tussled and I tore, ended up tearing my ACL and I had to have surgery. And I would, I would take, I would take the Percocet and I, re I actually remember it because it was a few years ago, but it was around this time. Like it was my birthday. I was supposed to be on crutches and I have staples in my knee and I'm like, oh, we're just going to party. Like it's going to be a good time. And I remember, and this, this is going to sound crazy, but I remember laying down on the couch and there, the bottle of Percocets, like sitting on a, on a dresser or whatever, on a table or something. And I'd lie to you, not, they were just like, hey, Aaron, like, take me, like, take me and it'll make you feel better. And they're like, it's, it's like, and I'm looking and obviously this is all happening in my head. And I just like hobbled upstairs and I just gave them to my mom like here. Mm -hmm. And I haven't, mm -hmm. I haven't touched, I haven't been able to take any muscle relaxers, anything like that. Um, because addiction also runs in my family. And I know that once you start is really, really, really hard to stop. So super transparent posts, everyone. <laughs> What's up, dude? Transparent stories over here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, shout out to you for again recognizing you know that you were starting to use them a little too much and and let's talk about really quick that support system because you said you surround yourself you surround yourself with good people and I truly truly believe that when you surround yourself with with really good people who only want the best for you it's really hard to fail you know so 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 let's talk about like your support system. Um, who were they? How did they support you? Yeah, I think that's such an essential piece that it's like, it's a, 
something you hear all the time, right? But I think it's easy to say, it's a lot harder to implement and recognize and process and filter out. And the interesting thing is actually some of those people that were closest to me at that time, they're not really in my life anymore for a variety of reasons. Yeah, Not bad, not good, just life goes on, things happen. But I think the important piece that stuck out to me was, you know, my mom and um, I was living it with my mom at the time. I just got back from Vegas. So I was living in Vegas on my own. I came back, I lived with her. Uh, my brother was in Florida. So like, it was just me and her. And she was kind of like very aware of like, I'm super transparent with my mom. Me and her have a very open relationship as far as like, I tell her everything, you mm -hmm. know, like pretty much <laughs> everything that goes on in my life, she knows. And um, yeah, like I would like take them in front of her or whatever I'm doing. Like I don't hide things like that. Mm -hmm. And she started to say things. And I was like, eh, you know, even that maybe used to be my mom. And then I had friends I trained with that started to notice it. And then even friends of mine that I didn't train with that I would just kind of like hang out with and like, hey man, we're starting to notice like you're doing that. And I just had three or four people say it to me that were really close to me. I was like, all right, it's, if it's like one person, okay. Maybe they're just being um, a kind of like over hypersensitive person to it. But when like a few people are saying it, it's pretty consistent. And then also like, if I'm being honest with myself, being, I'm pretty, I'd like to think I was self-aware and I, I continuously try to always be self-aware in those kind of components. So that, and that's the thing, like, even I always go back to this question is like, how is whatever I'm doing serving me? Does it serve me? Does it not serve me? And being very brutally honest, like having the brutal, honest inventory of the choices we make, decisions we make and how they show up in our life. And even the people in our lives, like you'll go through stages and seasons of like, Hey, this, this person can be a, not even that you need to get something from them, but they could be serving you. But then maybe you're no longer in that stage of your life anymore. And you need to move past like friends that are great to socialize with and hang out with, but like all they want to do is do that. And that might not be serving with what your mission is on, especially when I talk to my fighters and athletes, like you can have friends. I've had kids I grew up with since I was like eight, but if they don't want to be physically active, I don't judge that. But if they can't understand, Hey, I got to go to the gym right now and go to practice. And they're like, Oh, just hang out with us. Like I have to start to separate if mm -hmm. on the other side though, I have great friends. I still talk to to this day that are like, Hey man, do your thing. Like they'll be like, Hey, like work out in my house. Like you can work out here. I'll work out with you. I might not be at your level, but I'll support you in that. And that was a really big piece of it, honestly. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, how long have you, you said you started coaching after you got injured? Yeah, that's where I really started to invest in the martial arts coaching side of it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I've been a trainer since I was 18. I'm, I'm 34 now. So, you know, that's 16 plus years. Um, but that happened in our, when I was like 23. So let's call it like 2012 math serves me sounds like 10 years yeah so like 2011 2012 13 area and then so it's been about like wow i'm getting old i'm like doing the math now and doing like <laughs> coaching just on that side of it especially with the ufc and when i got hired by the ufc i got hired more for like the strength conditioning side of things mm -hmm. um and i would still like help out they had already their muay thai people they had their jiu-jitsu people so i would just support them but i was more strength conditioning trainer kind of a role and that's why i really started doubling down on that piece. Cause I couldn't fight. And I still had the same kind of energy and bandwidth. I just couldn't put it into my own career. And yeah. throughout all of this, I also had my company life of a fighter. And I started that as I was an amateur. And like I, Randy Couture is a big mentor of mine and influence in my life from even like a business component and seeing how he operated as a business in Vegas. And, you know, my parents are accountants. So being able to say, Hey, like you should have a company and then being able to see like the role coaches can have in people's lives was so fulfilling and rewarding. It really helped me have a purpose. And I think purpose is such an important thing for people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Purpose. That's a big word. What does purpose mean to you? Yeah. So there's, there's a Japanese term called Ikigai. And this is, I, I highly recommend everyone like Google this. There's a book called Ikigai. You don't have to get it if you don't want to, but it was, there's literally a Venn diagram that shows how I see it as, as purpose and, and what it means to me. So it's, there's four layers or four pieces to the Venn diagram. It's what you're naturally good at. What does the world need? What can you get paid to do? And what do you actually enjoy doing? And where mm -hmm. all four of those things overlap is like purpose to me and your icky guy and like what you can spend your energy doing. And that was a big one when I was able to come across that, that really drove home the idea of what purpose means to me. So I don't know if that directly answers the question or kind of maybe indirectly. No, absolutely. No, I'd like personally, what did it mean to you? You explained it exactly the way 
I wanted you to. <laughs> I want you to be a, as authentic as possible. And if if that's you know where you take it, then where that well, that's a good that's a good answer. Um, purpose. Do you think purpose and passion um, are they parallel, or do you think they're the same? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, I love great questions. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, th- yeah, I'm, I'm trying to like digest. That. I got to think for a second. This is where like, I don't know if you ever watch Elon Musk interviews, but like one thing I respect about him is like, he won't just answer right away. He'll like truly stop and think about things. And mm-hmm. I don't normally do that. I have, I'm going through like an emotional intelligence course right now. And that's something I've learned is to like, stop, breathe, think, and then act or choose or do what we're going to do. Mm-hmm. So if I really think about like, I, I definitely think they're parallels. I don't know if they're one in the same because you could have, I have a lot of passions. Like mm-hmm. I have a lot of different passions, but not all of them are my purpose, if that makes sense. Absolutely. And I feel like passion is almost like a key ingredient for purpose, but, and you, you need that to have it. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that if you have a passion for something, it's going to be your purpose, but it mm-hmm. can't be your purpose without passion. That's kind of how I look at it. Love that. I love that. It can't be your purpose without passion, but your passion doesn't necessarily have to be your purpose. Right. Cause I I got a lot of passions. Like I like video games. I like, I, I love not only like the fitness and the health side. I like tech. I like, you know, even, you know, cryptocurrencies. I like investing, but like just because I'm into investing doesn't mean investing is my purpose in the world. Like, but where all these things overlap, that's truly where, where the purpose is for me. And to me, it goes back to like, just people. Like I, I have this thing, even on our social media, my scene, like I take pride in, you know, we've transformed over 4,000 lives. Actually, I got to update this number because we did a giveaway. I emailed you this. So our number is actually, I checked it as of today. We're at 25,007 lives we've transformed with our health and wellness course. Um, so to me, it's, you know, that's the purpose. My, my purpose, in my opinion, is like transforming lives with health and wellness. That's, that's what I'm here to do. And that's what I want to do. And honestly, like, then I think about legacy. That's a really big word that gets thrown around. It's like, as cheesy as it sounds like my kids are my legacy. Like they're going to be here more than I am. They're going to have such a strong impact, especially having daughters, like Mm -hmm. having women, man. Like I, it's watching my wife give birth first off and understanding how intense that is. And then seeing I've never thought about when I was growing up my whole life, and this is just maybe my ignorant perspective, I would walk down. I've been in dangerous neighborhoods and stuff. I've never thought about being raped. I've never thought about being violated in a certain way that when I have daughters, I was like, I, we have to have that conversation and I need to prepare them for certain things. And like, I never thought of that before. So I don't know. I'm kind of going on a tangent here, but the idea of like, to me, it goes back to like transforming lives and the legacy component and purpose and all those things. And like, considering all those factors and variables is, is such an important piece. Absolutely. Legacy. Um, you're, you have two daughters. Um, what is fatherhood like to you? Man, it's the best. It's, it's, I mean, it's not all rainbows and sunshines. Like of I course. talked with my cousin about this. We have a, also a podcast called real family ish on, on Amazon. And we talk about, it's not all like great, you know, it's awesome, but there's moments of like, if I'm going to be honest or like, I freak out. Like I, um, that's where me me and my wife, we have a good partnership. I think that like, if I'm, if she's freaking out, she'll say tag. And like, I tag in, I'm like, you go breathe, go like Mm -hmm. take a nap or whatever, which is hard for it. Like she, she hasn't slept really in like four years since having her older daughter. Like she hasn't really gotten a good night's sleep in years. Mm -hmm. Um, and fatherhood long windedly is, is just, it's the most rewarding thing that, and I like people will tell you that, and you could hear like, you'll never love someone like your child, but like, once you, you experience it for real, it's like, you can, I, now I can understand it. And it like, it was the reason I actually retired from fighting. Like when I knew I was having a kid, like I didn't want to hurt people anymore. And I didn't want to live in a world or create a world around my daughter. And I don't think there's anything wrong. There's tons of fighters and friends of mine that have active careers that have kids. I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but I just didn't want to allocate that bandwidth and that energy to that. And I wanted to have it on her. So it was, while it's a big sacrifice at times, it's like the most rewarding and joyful thing that I can ever experience fatherhood i love that i love i love <clears throat> the i think the majority of interviewers i've had on this podcast have been have been men and the the few that have kids 
the joy that I get from watching and listening to to you all share your stories of like fatherhood, it's amazing because there are so many people out there who don't who, who never get to experience that, you know. And on being on the other side, like there's so many children who never get to experience what it's like to have such an active, encouraging, positive, like role model of a father figure or a father in their lives. And, you know, it's just, it makes me, I get all giddy and happy listening to, (laughs) listening to the stories just because life, you know, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, life. And if you can't, if you if you can't share a story um, of encouragement and, and happiness, then what exactly are you doing? Um, and I think I think parenthood is is a sweet spot where a lot of people find a lot of their joy. That's beautifully said. Now now here we now here's the here's a caveat, right? Mm-hmm you love your you are a man of service you love being of service how do you serve yourself self-care dude that's such a great topic i'm glad you said that (laughs) and i'm gonna be transparent like super transparent i find it easier than i think my wife does or i think from my observation i would almost want to ask you this question i'll obviously answer the question but i from my perspective what i noticed with moms and almost women in general and i'm making a pretty general statement here is i feel like it's harder for self-care from my observations for a variety of different reasons from society's impact and all those things. So for me, self-care has been an interesting dynamic because, you know, even as I go through this like EQ course and, and emotional intelligence kind of development, I realized like I've always put my business, my career, my fighting, myself first, my finances, eventually when I, that was the priority of my business before like relationships, before anything else. And mm-hmm. in the last like less than a year, even I've, I've really prioritized connections and relationships. And I looked at my life and realized how relationship poor I was and how I get to now invest and pour myself back into that. And the point of me saying all that is like, for me, self-care is connecting with people is being able to just chill and like have conversations like this. Like, believe it or not, this is self-care to me. Like being able to talk to you and being able to just not, you know, have my phone going on. And I love, like, I love, I clearly love talking and I love being able to talk to clients and, and deal with business and have meetings and all that fun stuff. But that's been a big self-care being able to just go for a walk, turn off my phone or read a book. Those have been big ones. Being able to get a massage has been something I tr- I've learned in, since being in Thailand because massages, the, the like currency exchange is so crazy that you can get a massage for like with a tip and with a nice tip, you can get a massage for like $15. Um, that's like with a really nice tip. And I would basically do that like almost every day. And I realized like, this is awesome. And just having that time and then, so to, to kind of recap that to me, it's, it's about self-care and being able to take time for ourselves, which especially for, I think the mothers out there more than even, and this is just maybe my perspective. There's a lot of dads that don't do the self-care and they're just so committed to the business side. And then like trying to have time with the family and then not taking time for themselves, being able to do that is I think such an important piece because you can't pour from an empty cup, right? Mm. So you need to be able to <laughs> fill yourself up absolutely that's that's it right there that that's it right there i had a call i was on a call with one of my clients earlier and i said hey you you can do it all you've proved that you can do it all you got you got it i know you can do it you know you can do it but now it's time to understand that you don't have to you need to stop Because you can't, you cannot show up for all the responsibilities in our lives. We can't show up if we're not mentally, physically, emotionally good in a good headspace, you know, and doing all the things, it it seems so like it's an honor, right? It's you're doing, you're doing, I'm doing all the things. But over time, that starts to wear. That starts to wear in your body. It starts to wear in your mind. And now simple things like going to a celebration is like a, a task. Instead of, instead of a, 
fun or an activity that like it should be. So yeah, absolutely. Remembering to get back to what it is that brings you joy. That's the key because you definitely, you can pour from an empty cup. You cannot. Yeah, it's the get to's versus the have to's, right? Listen. Hey, 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 y'all. Listen, it is time for some action. If you are enjoying the content that you've been listening to, I need you to rate and review. That's it. That's all. Make sure you go to wherever you're listening to this podcast and rate and review it for us. We appreciate you so much. Let's get back to some resilience. Sin, I... I spoke at a student leadership conference. I had to introduce, see, I had to. I introduced um, Jason Elliott. He was one of the speakers. And I was really nervous. I got thrown out to do this, like with maybe 12 hours to prepare. I had to put together an entire bio. I went online, couldn't find anything on him. Now he's everywhere. But went online, couldn't find anything from him. And, um, one of the advisors was like, when he gets here, I'll introduce you. He get there. I'm like, hey, Jason, um, my name is Aaron. I have to I have to introduce you tomorrow. Can you tell me about yourself? He's like, I'm going to stop you. He was like, if you change your you have to, to you get to and view it as an opportunity rather than an, a task or to do, that will change the entire, your entire mindset. And from that, that was in 2015, from that point, nah, 2016, I think maybe, my have-tos and get-tos, I've been very, very intentional about what I have to do and what I get to do. That's a great word too, intention. That, I and love that. Let's talk about it. What, what, do you, what does intention mean to you? Yeah. So intention is such a powerful thing. It's like, especially as I go through different types of training and like, even like working with athletes or, or even my own goals or like intention. So to me, intention is the combination of clear communication and an understanding of what you want. So I like, I'll give you a perfect example. Like I, and this is something I, I have to, I get to have to, I get to <laughs> continuously develop and work on, I'll have an expectation of my wife in my mind. And I realize I'll never actually tell her what the measurable expectation is. Um, and then I'm like, when it doesn't happen, I'll be like, Hey, what? And then I, I get nasty or short or whatever. And to me, the point of that is the intention is the communication piece of it, whether it's with ourselves or with those around us. So like, for example, I'll go back to Deuce just because I know you had him on. And like, so Deuce, from an intention perspective, his intention is I'm going to show up to train and I'm going to get this out of training. So for example, we have sparring tonight. I'm coaching tonight at the gym. Shout out to Rogue Combat Club. So what I have my fighters do, and I have clients do this, before every session, I have them write out one to three things they want to have accomplished in that class. Because if we just aimlessly go through it, you could still have a great training session. But without the clear you know, direction, you're not necessarily going to get as much out of it. And then you get to the opportunity to ask yourself at the end of class. And I also have them kind of write a summary, like, okay, my intention, this class was to move my head and be first. So I want to be the first person to throw a strike and I want to consistently move my head so I don't get hit. And then that's the intention. So cool. We can focus on that. Even if other things fall by the wayside, we have that intention. And then at the end of class, we can review and say, Hey, what happened? And it's an opportunity for us to see, Hey, well, did I not move my head because I was so focused on thinking that I stopped doing that or I got distracted or I got hit once and then, or whatever happened. So to me, the idea of intention is having a very clear understanding of what you want and the ability to communicate that. If you can't communicate it, that means we may want to spend more time on looking at what our intention is. And then it goes back to purpose. Like if, if you're not excited about the intention you're creating either, like you maybe want to look at why you're even doing it. What's the purpose behind it? Love it. Love it. Intention, purpose, clarity. Clarity is, clarity is key. Because if you can, if you can verbalize what it is, that that puts you one step further than someone who's having having trouble with maybe finding the language, you know, and clear having a clear vision of what it is and where it is you want to go 
that doesn't necessarily that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to do everything on the, on that journey. But having that clear vision knows that when you get to a point and maybe you have to pivot and you have to make adjustments, you're, you still have a clear vision of the end goal, of what it is that you want, what it is that you, that you need. That's perfect. I love it. I love it. What, what is your definition of resilience? Ooh, Ooh that's a great question too. <laughs> yeah, all the good questions. Yeah, I think that's also a, an important question because it's a word we use a lot, right? And it's a word that gets thrown around. And my initial thought, the first thing that comes to my mind is... This, this is a question I kind of ask everybody. And this is, it's just like an indirect answer. I'll get into like a more specific definition is I, I'll paint the scenario in my, my first title fight. I, everything was like kind of going wrong leading up to this fight for a variety of reasons, whether it was like, I was fighting the promoters, like best fighter. He was favored. I beat like all their other fighters. So they gave me the like, coach. It's like the head boss. Like I went through all these levels and I get to the head boss. <laughs> like and, video um, games. Yeah, exactly. And like <laughs> the, the blood work, there was issues with the blood work. So I had to go get blood work done like a day before the weigh-ins and like my coaches were having issues. So one of my coaches who's always in my corner, wasn't going to be in my corner. All these things came up. And the question I ended up asking myself was if I knew I was going to win first round knockout, would I go through all of this? Would I go through all the stress? Would I go through all of that? And the answer is of course, yes. And there's been moments I've asked myself if the result and the outcome was exactly what I wanted, would I still go through with this? Sometimes I say no. Like sometimes I wouldn't because the compromises or some of the, the cost of it wasn't worth it at the time. So I say that to say, I, I like to ask people and the idea of resilience to me is being able to do, and like Mike Tyson had a great quote. I think he was on Joe Rogan's podcast. It's like doing what you hate, but doing it like you love it. And to me, the definition of it is knowing that you have to get it done and then you be able to shift yourself into getting it done and being able to be okay with that. Being present. To me, resiliency is just acceptance. It's the acceptance of no matter what I have to go through right now, I'm going to go through it instead of resisting against it. And that's what's ironic is resilience and resistance sound very similar, but they're complete opposites. Mm -hmm. right? They're being able to accept and continue to show up. And to me, an interesting thing about resilience is almost the acceptance that you might fail too, is the idea and understanding like, hey, I might actually fail, but I'm okay with that. And that's to me, a, the long-winded kind of definition of resilience is the acceptance and willingness to do the task, even if you acknowledge that failure could be an option. When, when since, <clears throat> since we're on failure, aside from, Aside from the fights that you that you lost, when is a time in your life that you fell flat on your face? Ooh, so many. Uh, <laughs> I'll go with the I'll go with the recent one actually because this one's really relevant. So the the health course I actually we used to transform twenty five thousand lives in the last and I did this in like three months by the way. It's been in like less than ninety days. We just I declared and I had intention that I was going to transform twenty five thousand lives and we made it happen. That's what nice. we did. We offered it up for free. I didn't even care about the money. I was like, listen, I know when we transform 25,000 lives, money takes care of itself kind of mm -hmm. a deal. And like these people that see results and can invest in themselves and they'll do that. So my point of saying that is the course we actually use for everyone to kind of go through the first time I created and launched this course, I, it was a, it's, it still is, it's going to be a paid course starting again, July 1st. And we're actually completely changing the price. It's going to be like a thousand dollars and we have a higher ticket kind of price point around that. But the first time I created it, I, my goal was I created this course and I wanted to have, I think it was like a hundred people sign up for it. I think when I launched it, and it was like a hundred dollars or like $200. And when I launched it, we spent like $3,000 on advertising. We did all these things. I spent another like 1500, $2,000 on courses. And so I spent like a good $5,000 in creating this. I think we had three signups and it cost me pretty much all like, like I made maybe 600 bucks and it cost me like 5,000. So I was like negative 4,500 bucks. And that like, it was soul crushing. It was so, and I told my wife, this, I'm like, I don't even know, what am I doing? Like, do I even want to do this anymore? Like I've had offers to sell my company. And I was at a point where I'm like, do I just sell this cash out? And, like move on with my life and accept that I'm a failure. Um, and that was a really great opportunity to a have resilience and say, Hey, like 
I get to keep showing up for things like this. And if I fail, that's okay. I accept that. It doesn't define me. But that was a moment where I really felt like I failed on my, I fell on my face and it like hurt mm-hmm. bad. It made me question some decisions in my life and where I wanted to go. And I'm grateful I had that because now I've actually refined it and tweaked some of the things because of the learning experiences and feedback we got. And now it's been a platform and a tool we've used to transform thousands of lives. And now it's an opportunity where like, it's actually one of the best things I actually have to offer people, ironically. Yeah. Tell, tell us about it. What is it? Go ahead and shameless plug. Plug it in. Oh, thanks, dude. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, it's originally I started it as an ebook um, almost like eight years ago. And it's, the idea is it's a 28-day course that we have people go through. And the idea is it's, it's centered around nutrition and habits. We do have a workout plan that goes with it. But the idea is you go through a four-week process. So week one, we call it our reset week. And the whole thing is called the 28 day reset. Cause we're trying to reset habits. We're trying to reprogram some of the things that we have that we unconsciously will just go through without thinking about it. So week one is being able to leverage fasting for those that can fast. Not everyone's going to fast. Like, I don't think everyone should be fasting or doing intermittent fasting, depending on if you, depending on time of month and where your cycle's at, if you're pregnant, if you have any other conditions, diabetes, like there's so many variables, but the point of me saying all that is it goes through this step-by-step process that gives you everything you need from the shopping list to the meal plans, to the habits, to the guidelines, to the checklist, to the workouts that helps you go through this. So when you come out in week four, you not only have eliminated or kind of pulled back on certain foods and then reintroduce them to see how your body responds like sugars or gluten. Not everyone has a, a, the same gluten allergy or response. I'm not saying you should all be gluten free or not. Everyone has uh, you know, allergies to every single thing, but it's re- reducing our consumption of it and reintroducing it, see how our body responds. And then, mm-hmm. cause there's an interesting thing that I find very, very interesting. I take for granted is like when I ask clients or people, how did that feel? Sometimes like I have no idea because they're so disconnected from their bodies and how things can feel that they don't even have the awareness to it. So it's really about creating that real uh, habit, but also awareness to what we're doing to our body and with our body. So what we put into it, how we use it as a machine, how we move, how we sleep, stress. And then ultimately it's the foundation. I have all of our clients go through it. And then once you get out of that month, then we get the opportunity to like build on this foundation to be able to say, Hey, what, like even my fighters go through it. Like Deuce has gone through it. Like all of our guys have gone through in different capacities. Um, and, and it's really, I think such a powerful thing. That's why I wanted to use it even as a, a kind of a scholarship program to, to help people. Cause I know that I I've had, you know, we work with doctors too. So doctors refer people to us to actually run through this. So we get their sign off that they can do everything. And I can't tell you how many, you know, conditions, because here's the scary thing. Obesity is one of the biggest um, variables of comorbidity of things that people will die from that we actually have control over. Mm. So that's something that's such a powerful tool that we, I always found able to reinvest and give back to people. So that's a long-winded rant a little bit. I apologize, but I appreciate the ability to kind of share that with you guys. And um, yeah, it's, it's such a great thing to see those stories and see that people kind of embrace it. Oh, absolutely. So basically this 28 reset, 28 day reset is for some people, it's like, <clears throat> it's like introducing your mind to your body. That's a beautiful way to put it. Beautiful. You can use that. You can use that. <laughs> I don't care. Totally taking that. <laughs> intro, intro, it's like introducing or, or some people reintroducing your mind to your body. I want to do it. I'm going to take advantage of this. I'm going to do it. As soon as we get off of here, I'm I'm going to go. You got you. You send me the link and I'll make sure all of this, all this information goes in the show notes because I know a lot of people who who are going to tune in, they're going to want to, to, to get involved as well. And any, any type of, cause I'm big on service too. Like I, I live and breathe to serve. Um, my my motto from from the very very beginning has always been leaving this world better than I found it, starting with myself. That's beautiful. You you gotta start. I cannot I cannot stress this enough. There is no way that I can sit here and coach people, con- consult people, or influence people on things that I absolutely have no idea what I'm talking about. 
the stuff that I talk about, resilience, this, this podcast is called Resilience in Action for a reason. You know, I, I didn't just pull it out of the sky. Like we all, we all have resilience and we all have resilient stories. And the, the beauty behind it is that resilience in motion, that resilience in action. And I just, I just love having people on who are passionate about what they do. Mike, you are pa- so passionate about what you do and the lives you're transforming. It's, it's, you're inspiring me to, to go out and do something else. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm an, I don't know. I don't know. But I'm, I'm going to go out and, and do something, something today. I try to do something nice for somebody every day. But we might have to, we might have to up the ante today or something. I don't know. But this has been a, an inspiring conversation And I hope that anyone who's listening, who's watching, picks up on all the information, the gems that you shared with us. Um, What else do you have? What else do you want to share? Do you have anything else that you want to let the people know? So one thing really quick that I just want to say is this is an age old is like takes one to know one. And sometimes that's like a negative connotation, but I think whatever you see in me, you obviously have within yourself. So I just want to reflect that back to you as a mirror from an inspirational standpoint, having these kind of, it's truly inspiring to me and seeing what you're doing and watching what you've created on social media and hearing from Deuce. And I, I just wanted to like give that back to you because from my experience, sometimes in the um, service industry, It can be a thankless job. It can be taken for granted. There can be a burnout variable. So from everyone that you have ever interacted with, I get to represent them and say, thank you. So I wanted to start with that. So I think that's an important piece. I I don't know if that makes sense. And if you can maybe, if that resonates with you, but like truly, um, because the world needs more people like you and, and we get to create that and connect and, and put that out there. And, um, yeah, the one thing we actually have, so I just found this out yesterday and I don't know when people are going to see this. I'll give, so what I do want to say is for anyone that sees this and it's after July 1st, you're not going to be able to opt in for free through the website, but just email me, go to our contact page, just say that you saw this. I don't want finances to be the reason that holds somebody back from being able to invest in themselves and take action. So if you need, we'll still keep a scholarship program. And I'll just, you know, just mention that you heard this and that I'll, I'll communicate with you guys and, and, and hook you guys up. Um, but what part of our emotional intelligence course I'm going through is we have a seven day window um, that we do a legacy project where we fundraise for a non for profit. Right now we're doing a nonprofit called Blind Connect. And I never heard of this. I never thought of this until we had the call yesterday and the founders were on and they're blind. And first of all, I thought it was amazing. This is just ignorant on my part. I thought it was amazing how they were able to navigate Zoom and their computers while being blind. Yeah. And I was like, this is awesome. And I never thought about if you lose your sight, how challenging every aspect of the world is, especially in the technological age, especially mm-hmm. with like travel and all these things. So the only other thing I have to offer is um, for the next seven days, at least. So that means from what today till June 6th, June 7th, um, fundraising, we're going to raise over $87,000. I know we're going to hit a hundred thousand. We're just, the goal is 87,000. I'm personally going for 5,000 myself. So I, um, I, and I'll send you the, the page. We all have our fundraising page, but all the money goes hundred percent directly to the non-for-profit blind connect. You guys can check them out blindconnect.org. And it's interesting because in the healthcare, I never thought of this when you, you know, get injured, let's say you lose a limb, you get an injury, your ACL, I'm assuming you had rehab. Like I know I had rehab for my back. Mm -hmm. What's interesting about when you lose your vision that I didn't know about or think about this, there's no rehab for that. There's no like occupational therapy programs or anything that's dedicated for that in the healthcare space. Um, So there's private organizations, like there's actually paid schools and things, but not everyone can afford that. So then they have scholarships, hopefully. I don't actually know all the different programs, but Blind Connect's based out of Nevada and they're a nonprofit that just basically takes these people in, doesn't cost them anything. And they take them from, if you're losing your vision, they prepare you for it and get you up to speed. Or if you've already lost your vision, they kind of 
bring it everything from just like walking down the street to being able to use your phone, computer, how to eat, how to cook food. They, they, they were talking about having kids. And I didn't think about that, how that could be an issue with adopting kids or fostering kids, mm -hmm. because maybe you're not going to get approved because they think you could be a risk or, or the, all those things, the activities of daily living that are massive. So that's like a, a really, I'm excited about this fundraising um, opportunity that I get to do for the next seven days. And honestly, even though it's for seven days, like I'm going to continue to support it even beyond that. But we just kind of set this timeline goal. So that's my long winded uh, rant. And the other, the only other thing I really like had to share that I have going on that I'm, I'm really passionate about and that um, I figured it would just be fun to share with you guys as well. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I share this platform with whoever, whoever is on the other side of the camera. Um, I think it's, I think it is such a disservice to interview someone, have them on and not ask them about what what else they have going on outside of what we talk about. Like, you know, it's, it's pretty shitty. <laughs> it's just so to, because I, I brought you on, not only just to talk about, you know, your life and what you've gone through, but also to help other people, to inspire other people, to let them know that, hey, they're not alone. And who knows, there may be, you know, someone who, who is visually impaired and they're like, oh, I had no idea that this even existed. Boom, now, now it's on Resilience in Action forever. Like, yeah, I, I love it. So um, thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing all of that. I'll make sure I put, um, send me the links and everything. I want to make sure I get them in the show notes uh, so other people can can support you. How can we support you um, aside from those two areas? Um, how can we follow you on social media? What, what else you got going on? Yeah, I appreciate that question as well. And um, yeah, the um, pretty big on Instagram and Facebook. So at the life of a fighter on Instagram, life of a fighter on uh, Facebook, we have our lifestyle of fitness brand as well. And the reason I actually I'll I'll make a very quick story of it. Our brand is LOF. And stands for life of a fighter. But when I started working with doctors, they expressed that some patients might be intimidated by the idea of life of a fighter. Like, oh, I'm not a fighter. I don't, that's not what I do. So we used the LOF and just went lifestyle of fitness, which more people might be open to, to kind of working with and being able to help with them. So my point of saying all that is like following us on social media. Uh, also, I, and I was mentioning this to you before, Amazon, most people don't know this. I didn't know this. They've had a, a live streaming platform for three years now and they've really been pushing it now. And I get to create content on Amazon for free. So I put out free content there and I'll do workouts on Sundays. So if you guys want to join me for a workout, absolutely for free. So you don't have to worry about paying for anything. We do that every single week. I'm now like Deuce has his own channel. We're going to have our coaches and fighters and people come on. I'd love to have you come on and be able to, and like get you even set up on there and be able to reach thousands and thousands of people. So that would be the only thing if you ever want to see me. Now, transparently, I do also talk about products on a lot of the streams and it is a lot of it sponsored. So there is a paid interest there. Um, but the idea is it doesn't come out of anyone's pocket per se. And we, we, it's just a lot of fun to be able to just basically talk and have conversations like this, doing it live and being able to hopefully impact people and talk about things that we're passionate about. So on social media, Instagram, Facebook, the life of a fighter on Amazon, I have a coach Mike channel and I have my um, life of a fighter channel. And then my wife, ha we have like all these different channels, but I can also just send you like my link tree. Cause it's link tree forward slash life of a fighter. Mm -hmm. And that'll like everything that we have going on is pretty much on there. Perfect. 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 Awesome. Thank you for spending some time with us today. I, I can't thank you enough. Um, it's crazy. All the time that I spent at Rogue, I think, I know you gave a, you, you did a, a seminar one evening and I was able to catch that, but I wish we spent more time together, but I hope this is not like the end all be all because now that we've had this this conversation this connection i'm not i'm not saying i'm going to be a pain in your butt but you're not getting rid of me <laughs> exactly. dude this is what i always tell people you're stuck with me for life now yeah like yeah. we've 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 bonded we've we've bonded now i feel like we are we've we've elevated we're on a different level now so um is there anything else that 
that you want to share? Anything else before we get out of here? I really just want to say thank you for the opportunity, for you taking the time, um, for you doing what you do. And for everyone out there listening, the biggest thing I can stress is like, I've definitely experienced the idea of hopelessness in my life and feeling hopeless and feeling like there isn't that. And it's a very lonely, daunting, horrible feeling. And anyone that feels that way, don't, please don't hesitate to reach out. I know that's a cliche and I don't care about money. You don't have to pay for my time. Like I'm fortunate to be in a position where like I've done enough and I, I do the things that I do so that I can make the money that I make and have that side of my life. But then also I get to dedicate time and bandwidth and space to people that may not be able to financially invest or afford it, or just have, sometimes it's nice to just talk to somebody and share something, get it off your chest. So that's the only thing I'll say is like, if you guys are feeling hopeless or alone, like reach out to me, like I'm the one that answers the messages. I, I have a team that supports me, but I'm the one answering. You'll get on the phone with me. I'll email you, whatever you guys want to do. Like I'm here. And I, I know what that feels like. And I don't want anyone to have to feel like they're hopeless and alone and deal with that by themselves. Perfect. Perfect. I love, love that. Um, I have, I know I asked you about resilience earlier, um, but I have a question that I ask everyone before, before we get out of here. Um, what can, I'll, I'll switch it up since we talked about resilience earlier. Can you describe resilience in action? Oh, great. <laughs> oh I like that. I like that great, just full circle component. So to me, resilience and action is going back to that idea of in, in a phrase showing up to me, resilience and action is showing up in a consistent fashion because there's days where like the have to creeps in where like, I have to go do this. And then it's being able to pivot, stop, think and say, Hey, I get to go do this. And then looking at how do we create that mindset? How do we get to say, I have to, I'm going to just make up a scenario, like not make one. This is actually a real thing. It's like, I have to go take my daughter to school today and I'm just tired. And I don't want to do it. I get to go spend time with my daughter and connect with her and then be able to bring her into a scenario where she's bettering herself. That to me is resilience in action is looking at something you don't want to do and how can you reframe it to make it into a positive? Because then here's the other thing. I've been with people that they're doing something, but the energy isn't there and it feels mm. off. But when you get to reframe and see it as an opportunity, and I'm sure you could speak to this even when you gave that introduction, is it, it changes not only the energy of yourself, but the people around you. So that's to me, resilience in action is not just coming into a room, showing up and being consistent, but how do you show up and being able to bring that positivity? Cause listen, dude, like there's days, man, I don't always want to show up, but I do it anyway. And I do it, um, with that perspective as best that I can. Yes. That the being able to like the, you're fortunate being fortunate. You have the opportunity, you have the space, um, to do this. And instead of it being <clears throat> a burden, it can be a blessing. That's exactly it. And then remember gratitude. Like even going through this, this, um, this nonprofit work is like, I wake up every day with my vision, man. Like I get to see, I get to drive. Like the, the, even just seeing the founders on the call yesterday, they have kids. They're never going to see their kids. They're never going to see their kids. They get to hold them and hear them. And it's like, makes me want to cry right now, dude. Um, like I get to see my kids every day. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like that's, I don't know. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate that. That moment of transparency and authenticity that you just shared. That was, that was genuine. And, and uh, that was, yeah, I don't, that was good. Mike, I appreciate you so much for spending some time with us. Um, and I hope we'll, we'll talk again really, really soon. Oh, we will, Aaron. We will. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for listening to this week's episode of resilience in action with aaron brown if you enjoyed this episode make sure to rate review and subscribe and i want you to remember one thing resilience in action will always lead to a greater human experience